It's certainly an interesting time in astronomy, with recent results from the Kepler Space Telescope suggesting that there could be as many as 40 billion Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone of their stars, just within our galaxy. And based on these statistics, it's really quite plausible to imagine that not only could we not be alone in the universe, but that there could be civilizations potentially millions of years more advanced than we are today. And so, if these civilizations were to exist, it's only natural to imagine that they could construct quite impressive engineering projects, leading to huge structures surrounding their stars and planetary systems. But if these structures were to exist, what might they look like? And how would we find them and crucially test the claim that they actually are artificial objects? To do this, let's dive in and investigate the science of alien megastructures. There's never a quiet day in exoplanet research, and this is never more true than whenever a new discovery could potentially be linked into the age-old question of life in the universe. So recently, a certain star in the Kepler field, KIC 8463852, has been attracting a great deal of attention, following certain very anomalous features that have been identified in its light curve, with certain meter outlets screaming alien megastructures at the sky. But rather than summarising the surface details of this ongoing debate, what I want to do is get straight to the heart of the science at the matter here, and basically try and convey to you an understanding of the key principles at play, so that you can form your own reasoned conclusions based on the evidence. So firstly, what is an alien megastructure? Perhaps the best way to explain this is by looking at the energy consumption of a civilization, with an eye to the fact that throughout human civilization's history, we've steadily increased the amount of power that we've been consuming. So noticing this trend, Soviet astronomer Nikolai Kardashev proposed that you could classify how advanced an alien civilization was by looking at their total power consumption. If they were able to harness all of the energy falling on the surface of their planet, just coming from their parent star, they would be a Type 1 civilization, which incidentally is more advanced than we're currently at. Likewise, if they could harness the entire power output of their star, they would be a Type 2 civilization. And extrapolating that, if they could harness the entire power output of their galaxy, they would be a Type 3 civilization. The idea behind alien megastructures is that any civilization approaching the Type 2 status by necessity would have to build structures with roughly the same surface area as a planet in order to collect the solar power from their star. And it's these kind of colossal engineering structures that we're referring to when we talk about alien megastructures. Perhaps the most famous example is the Dyson Sphere, named accordingly after being popularised by Freeman Dyson in the 1960s. This would be a structure, or more likely a swarm of structures, that would entirely surround a star in order to capture its entire energy output. So by definition, whilst this wouldn't be visible to us just in the visible part of the spectrum, just in standard optical light, due to the laws of thermodynamics, it should re-radiate waste heat in the infrared or mid-infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And this is a detectable prediction. So there was a study using data from the IRAS satellite conducted in 2009 looking for waste heat from Dyson spheres within about the nearest 1,000 light years of the Earth. And unfortunately, the preliminary results from this study seem to rule out either complete or even partial Dyson spheres within those 1,000 light years, which places quite strong constraints as to the population of potential Type 2 civilizations, at least near to Earth within our galaxy. But then, of course, we could live within a very barren part of the galaxy. Maybe most of the civilizations live, say, closer towards the core of our galaxy, or indeed in other galaxies. So a natural extension to this search for waste heat would be to look for signatures from Type 3 civilizations in nearby galaxies.
Because if you imagine, if a civilization becomes type 3, they would have already built one Dyson Sphere, then a second Dyson Sphere, and then naturally the galaxy would gradually fill up with Dyson Spheres, which would produce an excess of infrared radiation that should make a galaxy populated by a type 3 civilization positively shine in the infrared. And this is a detectable prediction. So a study came out earlier this year in 2013 in the Astrophysical Journal that used data from NASA's WISE satellite in order to look for such an infrared excess in nearby galaxies. And it was kind of bad news for people hoping to see galactic super civilizations because it seemed to rule out any large scale galactic civilizations within the local universe. And by that, I mean within the nearest 100,000 galaxies. So that basically means that we have to refine our search for alien civilizations. So perhaps we should push down to slightly more primitive, but still much more advanced than we are civilizations. Let's say type 1.5 civilizations. That's potentially what we might want to look for in transit light curves. On a simple level, when an object passes in front of its star, it causes a small dip in the amount of light that we receive in our telescopes here on the Earth or in orbit around the Earth. So if we stare at a certain star for many months or even years at a time and measure a number of these dips as the object completes multiple orbits, we can plot the amount of light from the star as a function of time to create something called the light curve from the star. And this has been an incredibly successful method for detecting extrasolar planets. The first planet discovered by this method Ogle TR56b was found as recently as 2002, and since then the discoveries have just been exploding, particularly since Kepler launched in 2009. We've now found actually over 1,000 extrasolar planets confirmed by the transit method. So let's zoom in and actually look at a typical light curve that we would expect to see from a planet. Now I'll be going into the full mathematical description of where this shape comes from in my future series on the science of exoplanets. But the big things that I want you to take away is that the size of the dip depends entirely on how large the planet is, what its radius is. And so by fitting a curve to the experimental data that we obtain from staring at the star, we can figure out how large the planet is and also how wide its orbit is, so how far away from its parent star it is, and also how long it takes to complete one orbit. But all of the assumptions that goes into deriving the shape of this light curve assumes that the object is spherical as we expect for a planet. But of course, if aliens were to build a structure, why would they build a spherical structure? We can certainly imagine that they might build something like a giant triangle, for instance. So a natural question then is, how will the shape of a light curve change for non-spherical objects? In a 2005 paper by Dr. Luke Arnold, he examined what the light curve would be of a Jupiter-sized triangular shape, perhaps, for instance, a giant solar collector, passing in front of its star would be. The remarkable conclusion is that if you examine the discrepancy between the best fit planetary light curve and the resulting theoretical light curve for the triangular shape, the discrepancy would be around one part in 10,000, just as the object began crossing in front of its star, which would in principle be detectable by the Kepler Space Telescope. Arnold also considered the case of a rotating triangular structure and a series of structures forming a screen, all with similar conclusions that in principle you could distinguish them. There was one problem though, in that you can also imagine plausible natural explanations that could produce discrepancies also of this magnitude. For instance, a planet with an extended ring structure passing in front of its star. And so based on these conclusions, what Arnold proposed was that if you were to have a number of structures transiting in front of a star at the same time, with a very small difference in time between them, say ordered such that you would have one object pass in front of a star, then two, then three, then five, so you've got a kind of prime number sequence going on, then what you would expect is not just one transit, then one transit, then one transit, all with the same depth in the light curve, but instead you would expect variable depths in the transits. 
And so Arno proposed that variable transit depths could be a signature that megastructures could be involved. Arnold's proposal is just one concept of the kind of structures that aliens might build, of course, so let's examine another more recent one. In 2013, Dr. Duncan Forgan published a paper examining how something called a Class A stellar engine, or sometimes called a Shukadov thruster, would affect the light curve of a transiting planet. So basically what this is, would be a giant mirror which would reflect a large part of a star's light back onto the star itself using the momentum imparted by these photons onto the star in order to gradually accelerate and move the star and by extension the entire stellar system. A reason why you might want to do this for instance is say you're an advanced civilization and you notice that your star system is on a collision course with a neutron star or a black hole which would disrupt your star system, then you could build one of these to gradually nudge and move your star out of the collision path. So how would this affect the light curve? Well basically, if we're aligned favorably with the system that has the Class A stellar engine, it would block out a certain constant fraction of the star's light, resulting in the disk of the star no longer being circular in shape. This would mean that the light curve that we see when a planet passes in front of the star would no longer be symmetrical. And crucially, this asymmetry in a light curve is much easier to detect than even Arnold's prediction of variable transit depths. In fact, there's been one light curve observed which seems to display both of these predicted theoretical features that you might expect from an alien megastructure, namely an asymmetric transit and also variable transit depths, KIC 1255748, which was discovered a few years back. However, just because something is consistent with the in hypothesis does not mean it's actually anything to do with aliens or alien structures. In this case, the natural explanation has already been found in that this system contains a Mercury-sized planet which is being gradually evaporated by its star, producing an extended cometary tail around it. And that's what's produced the asymmetry and the variable depths here. So you always have to be cautious with making the alien claim. Just because something is consistent with the data doesn't necessarily mean that it's the correct explanation. So generally, you should always assume that there is a natural explanation, and it's only if you're able to systematically rule out all the plausible natural explanations that the alien hypothesis should start to bear fruit and then start to be considered as maybe being a possibility. This naturally leads us on to the curious case of KIC 8462852, which has been attracting all manner of crazy media attention recently for its fascinating light curve, which seems to be unique in the Kepler field that we've observed thus far. Again, this observes many of the hallmarks of both Arnold's and Forgan's models, with both asymmetric light curves and transits of variable depth. So some people have noted that it is consistent with the megastructure hypothesis, in particular Dr. Jason Wright in the latest paper in his GHAT series, which I'll post a link to down below. So the science team investigating the transits, firstly they were surprised because one of the transits was 22% deep. Just to give you an idea of how insane that is, we're talking that you would need an object about half the size of its star in order to block out that much light. And indeed the team has also concluded you would need at least eight transiting objects to produce the kind of shapes that we're seeing. So many of the standard natural explanations have already been ruled out quite conclusively. Things such as dust and gas, rings and also instrumental effects from just the Kepler Space Telescope itself with the current best fit natural explanation being a family of exocomet fragments formed from a recent single breakup event. And the science team admits though that even this is not entirely satisfactory at this stage. Dr. Wright's paper, which is an excellent read actually, it wasn't going around and saying, oh look, there are aliens living in this system. It goes through and systematically analyzes all the various anomalies in light curves that you could observe and what are both the natural and artificial explanations for both. And his key conclusion is just, this system, something really weird is going on. It's probably natural 
And whatever is the explanation, it's going to be fascinating, but he suggested that it is at the moment one of the most promising candidates for traditional SETI follow-up, particularly via radio astronomy. And since all this attention, there has actually been some preliminary results come out from a few groups reporting in the last week or so on findings from pointing radio telescopes at this system. And at the moment, there are no results. There have not been any radio transmissions observed from the system. So at the moment, we're not entirely sure what the natural explanation is, but the alien hypothesis is looking increasingly unlikely at this stage. So where do we move forward from here in our search for alien megastructures? Well, perhaps we should be looking slightly smaller for planetary scale engineering as opposed to engineering on the scale of an entire star system. And this concept was actually quite recently explored in a paper in 2015 by Dr. Eric Corpella. So here's the broad gist of it. 80% of nearby stars to the Earth are very small, cool dwarf stars called M or K dwarfs. Now around such a star, the habitable zone is so close that an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone would actually be tidally locked to its parent star, meaning that one side would always face the star and be constantly illuminated, much like how the Moon is tidally locked to the Earth and we only ever see one face of it. So any civilization arising on such a planet would only be able to inhabit half of the surface area because the far side of the planet would be entirely immersed in darkness and be much too cool to live on. So a young, ambitious civilization rapidly developing their own space capabilities may decide to launch a fleet of mirrors into orbit around this planet in order to reflect light from their star onto the dark side in order to illuminate it, heat it up, and therefore enable them to inhabit the entire surface area of their home planet. In Corpella's paper, he examined the conclusions and effects that this would have on the light curve, as you can see here, with the blue curve indicating the largest constellation of mirrors considered. And the interesting conclusion was that although the Kepler Space Telescope is not sensitive enough to notice these changes, both TESS and the James Webb Space Telescope, launching in 2017 and 2018 respectively, would be sensitive enough to detect the features from this constellation of orbital mirrors. This is an incredibly exciting conclusion because M dwarf stars are the most common type of star in our galaxy. And so that means that we might expect life to arise preferentially in M dwarf star systems much more often than in sunlight star systems, which are much less common. And so the fact that in the next few years we'll be able to push down and look for signs of intelligent life in M dwarfs well, let's say that that's an incredibly exciting and enticing prospect. But what if we do see something like Corpella proposes? How might we differentiate the alien hypothesis from natural explanations such as an extended planetary atmosphere? Well, a good way to do this would be to look for wavelength dependence in the transmission spectrum. So if it's a planet, we would look at the light passing through the atmosphere of the planet and look for absorption and emission features due to the chemical elements present in the atmosphere. But if it is not due to an extended atmosphere, because it's just due to satellites that have no gases surrounding them, then you would expect the transmission spectrum to be entirely flat across the electromagnetic spectrum. That would be incredibly difficult to explain naturally. Perhaps not impossible, but that's the point where the AN hypothesis would have to be seriously considered as a serious contender. So who knows, maybe we will see that one day. I certainly hope that we do. But until then, I'm not saying it's aliens. Thanks for watching. And if you're interested in learning more about alien megastructures, you'll find links to a number of the journal papers I mentioned in the description. This week's featured video is a look into the revolutionary Skylon spaceplane concept, which has just received an investment infusion of 20 million pounds from BAE Systems to develop their engine technology. Next time though, we'll be tackling one of the greatest questions of all, how did life begin? Be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss it, and feel free to drop a comment down below to join the conversation.